Today, I'm going to be sharing with you a secret that strong players use to completely destroy their lower rated opponents. The best part is, even if you're a less experienced player, you can use this trick to dramatically improve your results. And no, it does not involve any sort of memorization, any opening theory, and least of all, any dirty traps. Now, this is the point where most people would come up with their 50 point winning technique that no one can use because it's completely unpractical. I'm gonna do something a bit different. I'm gonna show you one of my games where I'm executing this. And perhaps at the end, you might be able to guess what the trick is. In this game, I had the black pieces and I'm up against Ferris Lim. Ferris is one of the brightest young talents from Penang and is well known for leading his team to MSM glory. So you'd expect a really tough game. Well, let's see how it turned out. My opponent went for d4 and after knight f6, the Trompovsky with bishop g5. I went for the most principled line, that is d5, it's taking control over the center and preparing to strike with the move c7 to c5. White plays e3, now c5, so we're trying to take control over the center. Knight f3, now knight c6, developing, c3, and now queen b6. So we have a very simple threat of taking the pawn on b2, so white has to play queen b3. Now c4, and white has a choice here. He can either go back to c2, declining the exchange of queens, but now we have a very typical idea. Bishop f5, and white can't take on f5 because pawn on b2 is hanging, and then the rook on a1 is going to drop. So after bishop f5, white has to play queen c1, and now there are many ways for us to continue. We can play knight e4, we can play e6, probably I'd go with move e6, and we have a very comfortable game, because white's pieces are kind of still very passive. After c4, white decided to take on b6, and now a takes b6. It might seem like we have these double pawns on the b file, but really, these are some very useful pawns, mainly because white cannot stop us from playing b5 to b4. For instance, if white plays a3, then we are going to go ahead and play b5 right now. We are preparing to play the move b4 to create some sort of weaknesses on the queen side. For instance, if white plays knight bd2, then we are just in time. b4, exploiting this pin on the a file. If white makes a random move, then we can take on c3, and now there are weaknesses on a3 as well as on c3. Well, if white plays the relatively best c takes b4, then after knight takes b4, well, black has a very comfortable game because of his superior pawn structure. As you can see, white has two pawn islands instead of one for black, and black has very comfortable development. If the rook ever moves to c1, we can just bring the knight back to c6, and we are just going to complete development with a very comfortable game. So here, white decided to play the move knight f to d2. So this seems a bit strange strange because instead of completing development, White is moving the same piece twice. But as we'll see, he has a concrete idea behind this move. So if we were to completely ignore what White is doing and play a move like bishop f5, well, now White can execute his own idea. Bishop takes f6, e takes f6, and now e4. And the point being that if we take on e4, then actually White can just take on c4. For instance, he can play knight takes c4, that looks strongest, hitting the pawn on b6, and suddenly Black has a bit of problems here because if b5 then knight e3 is hitting both the bishop and the pawn and that's why i played the move b5 this is a multi-purpose move firstly we have this same idea of pushing this pawn to b4 and creating some sort of weakness on the queen side we also defend this pawn on c4 making sure that if this e4 move is ever coming then well it's not going to be the end of the world we can simply just take this pawn and a very comfortable game now so after b5, white played the move knight a3. So he's hitting the pawn on b5. Obviously I pushed the pawn to b4, there's not much of a choice here. And here I think white made a serious mistake. Because actually, if he had played the move knight b5, he would have got quite a decent position. So why has a threat of knight c7? That's why the move rook a5 is very strong. Because he's hitting the knight on b5, and the idea is that if you play knight c7 ever, I can just move my king, and it turns out that your knight is completely trapped. So after rook a5, white should play the move a4, and here I wanted to play b takes a3, and after knight takes a3, a move like e5, for instance. And it's clear that black's definitely a bit better here, like black's pieces are more active, at some point we can take on a3, giving white these weaknesses, but this would have been the best chance. In the game, white went for the move knight c2, which is very passive. It's pretty much forcing us to take on c3, which we will happily do. And after b takes c3, now white has a lot of weaknesses on the queen side. Firstly, we have this pawn on a2, which 
As we can see, the open A file is really helping us to put pressure on this pawn. And there's also the pawn on C3, which we'll soon see is going to become a big problem for White. Now you might ask, doesn't White also get his own trumps? For instance, he could use the B file and attack this pawn on B7. Well, that's not exactly true, because as I always tell my students, a weakness is only really a weakness if your opponent can attack it. So now we play the move bishop f5, and we are attacking this knight on c2, but more importantly, this bishop is eyeing the square on b1, making it pretty much impossible for white to ever play a move like rook b1. The white knight currently has no good squares. For instance, if he plays knight b4, we'll simply take it, and after that play the move e6. And it's completely impossible to defend this pawn on b4. And even if you play move like a3, it doesn't help at all. We just take this pawn and there's a pin on the a file. So after bishop f5, white comes up with the best move. He takes this knight on f6. And again, the idea is that if we take e takes f6, then white can play the move e4. And after d takes e4, bishop takes c4. And white can always play move like knight e3 with quite a decent position. But after bishop takes f6, my opponent underestimated bishop takes c2. So now the bishop on f6 is attacked, so it has to go back, bishop h4, and now we're simply completing our development. Because when we are fully mobilized, it will be very difficult for white to defend all of his weaknesses against the onslaught of our pieces. Now e6, opening the diagonal of this bishop, white plays bishop e2, he's trying to complete his development as well. Now a greedy move here would be a move like rook a3. But this would not be in the spirit of the position. Going after this c3 pawn feels very premature because we haven't yet completed our development. As you can see, our pieces on the king's side are all sitting on the back row. Instead, there's a much stronger move. I played the move bishop a3. This is by far the strongest move. We are not only developing a piece, but we are also creating a game-winning threat of bishop b2, when the rook on a1 would actually be completely trapped. And if white tries to castle, well, that doesn't help at all because now we can play bishop b2 and after rook a e1, it's a sad day for white because literally every single move is winning for black. To be extra sadistic, I would probably just take on a2, followed by castles, and at some point pick up this pawn on c3. It's not going anywhere. So white, in total desperation mode, played knight takes c4, sacrificing a piece. To be fair, I don't see a good way to stop bishop b2 so maybe what he did was the best chance. But of course it's not enough. D takes c4 and bishop takes c4. There's no way that white's two pawns can give him anything close to enough compensation for this piece. Especially with our pieces this well placed. King d2, bishop comes back to g6, bishop d3 and you can see I'm just bringing my pieces in. Bishop e7, the a2 pawn is attacked as well as the bishop on h4. Bishop g6 takes Bishop takes e7 would not have helped because after rook takes a2, well, this is an intermediate check, so king has to move, for instance, d3, and after knight takes e7, rook takes b7, simply knight d5, hitting this pawn on c3, pawn on f2 is also hanging, so white has to go for c4, but now, simplest to me seemed to be to move rook a3. It's a check, so the king has to move, and now we simply pick up this pawn, and white only has a pawn for the piece, so it's a done deal. White played bishop g3, but now I'm winning back another pawn, and now white only has one pawn for the piece. The game did not last very long. Simply traded off the bishops, took the pawn, and ended up winning the game very easily with the extra piece. And now rook d3, winning the pawn on d4, and then also the pawn on f4, so white finally resigned. So how exactly did we win this game? Well, firstly, we had to create a weakness in the opponent's position, and we did this by playing b5 to b4 and taking on c3. And by doing this, we created some very nasty weaknesses in white's position, namely the pawns on a2 and c3. After this, we brought our pieces to attack these weaknesses in a very efficient way. That is, we're using an undeveloped piece, bringing it into action while creating a serious threat. And because of white's complete lack of coordination, he wasn't able to do anything about it. It's also worth mentioning that if you look at all the moves in this game, all of them were following the basic principles of chess. Keep in mind that these principles are there for a reason, and if you follow them, it will generally help you to play much better moves without needing to know any other knowledge, such as other opening theory. So I hope you enjoyed this little useful tip, and if you'd like to see more like this, then you can check out my MSSM preparation class, which starts next Monday at 9pm. Hopefully, I'll see some of you guys on Monday. Bye for now.